Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Dunwoody Community Church. Uh, my name is Tim Beard. I'm one of the pastors. Great to see everybody here today. Uh, we have a lot of cool things happening here today in the service. Um, but first of all, I want to welcome you. If it's your first time here or your first few times here and we don't know about you, I want to ask that you grab uh, the guest card in the seat row, in the seat in front of you, or you can go to the next slide right here and scan that QR code right there from your phone. Just love to know that you're here. Uh, get your name, your email address, and phone number. But welcome to Dunwoody Community Church. We have a lot of great things going on today. And at this point, I'm going to call up our teaching pastor, Jeff Jansen, who's going to kick off the service. And you chose well being here on time, because this is one of the really fun parts of being in a community. So let me ask the Tuckers to come on up with, with their little girls. Um, different churches have different traditions about how we welcome in our children. Uh, some churches baptize their children as a sign that they're part of the community. We dedicate them, that, that we take our kids and we say to God, these are gifts from you. You have blessed us with these children for a short period of time. They are ours, but forever they are yours. And so the Tuckers are going to do that with their two little girls this morning. And so we are going to do that. We are going to pray together over these little girls. So can you tell me your name? Addie. Can you tell me your sister's name? Everly. Everly. That was excellent. You sound just like your mom, by the way. So, we are, we are going to pray together. I'm going to stand over them. I'm going to lay hands on the parents because we are dedicating the parents as much as we are dedicating the children. But we are going to remind God of all those crazy promises that he makes in scripture. All the things that he says about raising children. I want to read you just one thing that the Lord tells us. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is his command to the Israelites, and it includes part of his command to parents. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk to them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your house and on your gate. We should be telling our kids about the Lord all the time. It should be all over our houses. It should be in our cars. It should be when we drive away and when we drive back. If you've ever read the screw tape letters, which is a letter from a demon to another demon, and he complains bitterly about this one particular family in this one particular house, he says, never let your guy go in this house because it reeks of Christ. It reeks of Christ. Anyone who goes in that house, they smell like him when they come out. The dog and the cat smell like him. The postman smells like him when he walks back down the path. Don't let them near that house. That's what we want. We want the Tucker's house to be a place that the demons say, oh, don't go near that house. It reeks of Jesus. So I'm going to pray out loud. You're going to pray in your hearts. We're going to dedicate the children. We're going to dedicate the parents. We're going to remind the Lord God Almighty of all the crazy things that he says about children and parents. So pray with me. Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray. I pray for my brother and my sister as you have entrusted these little ones to them. They belong to these parents for such a short period of time in all of eternity. But for these few years, you have entrusted Max and Aaron with these children. And so, Jesus, we pray for our brother and our sister. We pray that you will sustain them and support them. We pray that you will watch over them, that you will be gracious to them and kind to them, that they will always know how to speak to their children, which way to turn. We pray over them what you said in the book of Isaiah, that whether you turn to the left or to the right, you will always hear the voice that tells you this is the way. Walk this way. We pray that for our brother and sister, Lord, that they would always hear that voice 
especially when it comes to their children. This is the way. And Jesus, we pray for these girls. And we pray that you would raise them through their parents, that you would speak to them. They can't necessarily speak our language well, but you can speak to them fluently. You can talk to them in their minds and in their hearts. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would, that you are speaking to both these girls now, that when they can talk, they already know you because they've heard you. That when the gospel is presented to them, they say, of course, I know that. I, you, God already told me that. We pray, Jesus, that you would make them great in your kingdom. Whether they are great here on earth, that, that is not a, a big deal for us. But we so desperately want them to be great in your kingdom. To be people who are talked about with Moses, with David, with Abraham, with all of the saints down through the ages, people who have known you and loved you. We pray for these girls, Lord. We dedicate them to you. They already belong to you. Oh, but we gladly return them to you again. We pray for this family, that it will be exactly what we read in Deuteronomy, that, that you will be on their lips, you will be on their clothes, you will be on their doors and on their cars, that their home will reek of you, Jesus, that the demons will give it a wide berth, because it smells so much like you, and that smells like death to them. We pray, Jesus, for this family, that you will be gracious to them, that you will be at work in them, that they will be and do all that you want, because your spirit is powerfully on them and in them. And Lord, we pray this in your name, because we're praying everything that scripture says about families. We didn't write Deuteronomy, you did. So we pray it back to you, Jesus, in your name, we pray all these things. Amen. Well done, girls. Well done. We've had some that weren't as good as you.
can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God.
welcome to Dunwoody Community Church. I'm Tim Beard. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, what you've been seeing so far this morning are, are examples of making disciples. Uh, we saw dedicating our babies this morning uh, because we believe that parents are called to disciple their kids, to grow, see them grow up in the fear and the knowledge of the Lord. Uh, we've seen making disciples globally um, in a country that um, I'm not going to mention because this will be on the video, but that won't be on the video because it, we, we don't want people to know where they are because of dangers of being in the country. Um, but we are also going to be making disciples, not only here locally and globally, but also next uh, Sunday, we have a Guatemala informational mission trip. Terrell, stand up in a second. Just everybody see Terrell. Everybody say, hey, Terrell. You guys are participate so well in this service. That's really good. Uh, Terrell's leading a Dunwoody Community Church mission trip to Guatemala in, uh, in September. September what through what? Three through ten. So next Sunday after the church, if you want, or after the church service, if you're interested in finding out about that, go meet Terrell in Fellowship Hall after the service, and he'll give you the scoop on that, he'll give you lunch as well. Um, also, making disciples globally, um, Sophia and Grant, will you guys stand up? Sophia and Grant, we're sending them off as missionaries um, for, for a week, okay? So they're not going for a long time. But they're, they'll be going to Rome, Italy in a couple weeks. Sophia's going to be working with some music teams and everything. She's going to take a, a taste of Dunwoody Community Church worship to Rome. Grant's going to be going around talking to people while she's singing and everything, sharing the gospel um, so we'll be praying for them when they leave. I'm actually going with them, with, with Cindy, uh, and meeting up with some people over there, meeting up with Crystal, who you know, Crystal Mateo, is part of the church. Now, they are raising support. So um, if you would like to contribute to their funds to go to Rome, we have to raise support for the flight, for the lodging, the meals, all that kind of stuff, um, you can write a check to Dunwoody Community Church, just put Rome Mission Trip on it. You can put their name if you want. That's fine. Or you can go online um, to dunwoodychurch.org forward slash give. But they've got about $3,000 that you guys are still, still needing to raise. So um, look very forlorn right now. See that look? Okay. So yeah, help them out for that. And um, before we all head out, we'll be talking about that. Now we're going to talk again about making disciples locally. And I'm going to ask Anna to come up and share about all of our graduates. Everybody say hey to Anna. Good morning, everyone. So I am blessed to be able to honor our graduates this morning. We have several different graduates from different age groups. So starting out, we have some students that are graduating going into sixth grade. So they'll be no longer in Sunday school, and they'll get to come hang out with me in youth group. So we have our sixth graders are going to be Halia, who's back there. Can you wave, Halia? Hi. <laughs> and we've got Mary Eden. Is she here? And also, we've got some high school graduates, which is super exciting. We've got Joey back there. Can you wave, Joey? <laughs> Joey. And Celia, who I don't see. Um, and then lastly, we have some college graduates who I don't believe are here today, but we've got Ben and Maddie who are graduating from college. Um, so we're going to go ahead and pray for them now. Will you bow your heads with me? Lord God, I just praise you and thank you so much for... Um, Blessing these families with these, um, these children, these adults, Lord, I thank you for bringing them so far, Lord, bringing them through school, Lord, and I pray that you would just continue to bless them abundantly, Lord, as many of them are going in new phases of their life. I pray that you would be speaking to them and showing them exactly where you want them to go, Lord. I pray that they would look to you and trust in you for all their needs, Lord, and for all their desires that you would provide, Lord. I pray that um, for the college graduates that you would be um, at the center of their heart, Lord, and as they're going out into their careers, that they would be honoring you in whatever they do, Lord. I pray for the high school seniors, Lord, as they're trying to figure out what's the next step for them. I pray that you would make it so clear, Lord, that they could trust that you are going to provide, Lord, whenever you're ready to tell them, Lord, that you would um, accept them in whatever college you want them to be at or whatever other path that they might take, that you would provide a way, Lord, and that they would um, trust you and learn more about you in this path. And I pray for the sixth graders who might be going to new schools and starting a youth group. I pray that they would um, just get to know you more and more 
each day as they're growing and getting older, and I pray that they would really be blessed with new friendships and a new community in this new atmosphere that they're going to be entering in, Lord. And I pray over all these students that you would bless them, that you would keep them, that you would make your face to shine upon them and be gracious to them. And I pray that you would lift your countenance upon them and give them your peace, Lord, peace that surpasses all understanding. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, the students for Sunday school may be dismissed to their teachers, and I'm going to call up Larry Heron for a word of prayer. Let's pray. Lord, at various times in your word, after you have spoken, you said, Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Lord, I pray that that will be us today, that that will be me, that as Jeff comes and brings your word to us, that we will be quick to listen, that we will take to heart the things that you have to say to us today through your word, and that we will live it out in our lives, that who we are, what we think, what we say and do will be reflected because we had ears to hear you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Larry. All right, welcome back to another episode in our study on the ways that we worship. Not necessarily why we do something specifically. Ultimately, we do it because God tells us to. But but what should be going on in our hearts? What should we expect? What, What is God doing? What's the purpose of these things? So today, great news. We're gonna talk about giving. You picked the right Sunday to come in. So turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to talk about giving as worship. Why is giving part of worship? What is God trying to accomplish? I mean, God God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, Scripture says. He doesn't need us to give. He can do anything he wants. Why is giving part of what he uses in the church? So 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to start reading at verse 6. But this passage actually starts back at the beginning of chapter 8. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. He planted this church many years ago, probably six, eight years ago. And he will be making another visit to them shortly. And when he comes through, he is raising money for the church in Jerusalem. It is a rough time to be a Christian in Jerusalem. We're probably in the mid to late 50s A.D., And the Jews and the Christians do not get along at this point. There was a period early on when they did, but that is long past. And if you are a Jewish guy who's converted to Christianity, wow, you are not going to be held in very high esteem in that city. If you're a shopkeeper who's converted to Christianity, don't expect any Jewish people to frequent your shop. Uh, The Christians in Jerusalem are struggling. And so Paul is raising money as he travels around. Now, the church in Corinth has already promised to give money, and he's writing to them to remind them that they made this promise, to tell them about when he's going to be there, how he's going to collect the money, the details, everything else. But he finishes this whole section at the end of chapter 9. So we're going to read his conclusion because he explains to them, okay, why should they give? What's God doing? What's happening when they give? So read along with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 6, we'll read down to the end of the, the chapter. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, You will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. 
So Paul's pulling together a bunch of different threads from these earlier two chapters about the gifts and what's going to happen and how it's going to work and why they should do it. And he starts out his conclusion with this pithy little statement, which interestingly enough, as I was reading through commentaries and all, this idea of so sparingly, reap sparingly, so generously, reap generously, it is in almost every culture known to man. Almost every language on earth has this parable in it. In English, it's come to us as, you reap what you sow. But it turns out Norwegians in the Arctic Circle have a version, and Africans in the Sahara Desert have a version. It is a universal truth that God has put into the world when he made it. We say you reap what you sow. We almost always mean that negatively. You rarely, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say, you know, John, you're doing such great work here. I'm giving you a 15% raise because you reap what you sow. But you could. Paul gives both of them. He gives the positive and the negative. He gives the negative first. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And obviously it's a farm analogy. You know, farmers, you harvest your crop. When we were in Africa, we lived for a month with a family in Cameroon in the rural province. Of the, These guys were farmers. That's what they did. You've got all this corn. That's what they grew there. Right? And you need to keep most of it to eat, but you've got to set aside some of it for seed for next year. And so you've got to decide what that's going to be. And if you've got any extra, you can sell that, which is good. But now you've got this bag of seed. So imagine you meet a farmer, and he's got seed corn for 40 acres. He has enough seed to plant 40 acres, and he plants one acre. And he keeps back the other 39. Wouldn't you find that odd? Wouldn't you say something to him like, why did you only plant a 40th of your seed? And he says, oh, well, I might need that seed later. I got to hang on to that seed. Who knows? We could have a bad year. I might not have enough food. Wow, you only plan a 40th. I can pretty much guarantee you're going to have a bad year and you're not going to have enough. You can't grow what you don't plant. I mean, that's just a truth in the universe. If you don't plant it, it ain't going to grow. If you plant 10 acres of corn, you're going to get back 10 acres of corn. You're not going to get back 20. It's not going to magically migrate somewhere else. Whatever you sow, Paul says, that's it. That's all you're going to get back. If, if you sow sparingly, you know, spare, if you keep it back, if you hold on to it, Paul says, well, then you're going to reap sparingly. And then he says the positive, which is really interesting. We translate it, whoever sows generously will also reap generously. But what he says literally is he who sows for blessing, for blessing he will reap. For blessing. You know, it, the way he writes it, it really looks like it's some phrase he's quoting. Like, you, you know, we quote, you reap what you sow. Um, and we don't know if the original said for blessing or he's changed it or, or what. But I think it's really clever of him to put that in. Because in the farming world, as we said, you plant corn, you get corn. You plant wheat, you get wheat. If you plant grapes, you don't get apples. But in the spiritual world, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. In the spiritual realm, what you plant is not always what you harvest. But you plant for blessing, and you'll harvest for blessing. And I'll give you an example of that going on in our family right now. A couple of years ago, when our two sons moved out, Elizabeth and I said, okay, we've got two empty bedrooms. What do we do? We have three people in five bedrooms. Should we downsize? What should go on? We ultimately decided, said, oh, well, let, let's see if we can bless someone with these bedrooms. Let's offer these bedrooms to someone. And so we did. We prayed. We talked to people. We ended up offering a couple girls from our church who were having to move out. Their rent was going up and all that. Said, here, why don't you come stay with us? Stay for a month. Stay for a year. Whatever. Right? Just stay. We won't charge you rent. You, you could save some money. You can figure out what you want to do. So we, we offered these bedrooms. We sewed bedrooms. Maybe we sowed the rent we could have had if we charged someone for rent. I didn't reap bedrooms. My house didn't suddenly grow more bedrooms on it. You know? I didn't reap money. Right? I didn't get back the money that I didn't charge them for rent. I didn't get money back. I got joy. I tell people I traded empty bedrooms for joy. We have loved having these girls stay with us. Two weeks from now, one of them will become my daughter-in-law. I reaped, I sowed empty bedrooms. I'm reaping a daughter-in-law I adore. I'm reaping a godly wife for my son. His mother and I have been praying for that since before he was born. We sowed for blessing and we reap 
for blessing. And I had people tell me, you're crazy to let folks live with you. Oh, I'd have been crazy not to. I received so much good from letting go of two empty rooms. Paul starts this whole thing out about giving with, look, if you will sow towards blessing, oh, you will be blessed. You will get it back. And then he explains it. Look at verse six. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. That is the only command in this whole passage. That's the only thing you have to do. Everything past this one point is all explanation of the blessings that you will reap. The only thing he says to do is to decide what you're going to give and give it. And that word decide, I told you the language Paul's writing in, it loves to put little words together to make bigger words. It's the word choose and the word beforehand put together. You must choose beforehand what you're going to give, Paul says, from your heart. We've talked about this before. In this world, your heart is not your emotions. Your emotions are down here. They're in your gut. They're in your belly. Your head's your thoughts. Your gut is your feelings. Your heart is where they meet. Your heart mediates them. Your heart is you. Your heart is your will. Your heart is your purpose. It, it, it's you making decisions. Paul says you, and notice each of you, it's singular. He's talking to all of us as individuals. Each of you must decide ahead of time what you're going to give. And do it based on who you are. It's going to look different for all of us. Elizabeth and I spent 20 years in Wycliffe Bible Translators. Guess what over half, over half the missionaries we support, guess what mission they belong to? That's what we know. That's where, our, that's where our head is and that's where our gut is. Our emotions and our thoughts. We know Wycliffe. We support people in Wycliffe. That's us. That's who we are. But that's not who you are. Paul says everybody's got to decide ahead of time. Based on you, who are you? What do you care about? What do you love? What do you think about? You decide what you're going to give and then give it, Paul says. Don't decide reluctantly or under compulsion. Literally, not from pain and not from necessity. It's, it, you don't have to, don't give because, you know, if you don't do it, there's going to be issues. Don't give because someone's making you. Now, he doesn't forbid giving for those reasons. And he doesn't forgive spontaneous generosity. If you're driving down the road and some guy's on the side of the road, please help a homeless vet. You want to give money to him? Great, go ahead, give it. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about planning it ahead of time, deciding. That's what he says. Decide ahead of time what you're going to give from your heart, from who you are, from what matters to you. In the Old Testament, giving was commanded and it was prescribed. What you gave, when you gave, where you gave it, how you gave it, all that was in the law. You had no choice. On these dates, on these times, you gave these things in these amounts. It was all prescribed. It was commanded and prescribed. With Jesus in the New Testament, now that everyone has his spirit, it is no longer prescribed. It is still commanded. This is a command. You must give. But who you give to, when you give, where you give, how much you give, you get to decide that. You decide that from your heart, Paul says. From your brain, from your feelings, all of that together, you decide what you're going to give, Paul says, and then you give it. And that is the only command in this whole passage. Everything else is him telling us all the good things that are going to happen when you do that. So follow along with me. Verse 8. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you'll abound in every good work. If you're counting, there's five alls in that statement. Not in English, but in the language he writes in. It's all, 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 all. God can do all. All times, all places, all ways, God is powerful enough to do everything that needs to be done, he said, so that you can do what you need to do. And then he quotes Psalm 112. I'm going to read Psalm 112 to you. Like he just quotes one verse from it. I want to read you the whole thing. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their house, and their righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They'll be remembered forever. 
They have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph over their foes. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. The wicked will see and be vexed. They will gnash their teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. Okay, this is a totally serious question. By a show of hands, who does not want that psalm? Who does not want to be secure, to be not have worries, even in troubled times? Who does not want their children to be secure? Who does not want blessing? Seriously, put them up high. Who doesn't want that? Paul says that comes from deciding you're going to give and giving because God is powerful. And God can make sure you have everything you need. But there's the only command. Decide and then give. And the way he writes that, I'm, I'm getting all grammatical linguistically on you, but, but the way he writes that is hypothetical. God is able, he could do these things. It's in the future. This could happen. He shifts in verse 10 and he says the same thing, only now it's not hypothetical. It's absolute. It's future. Look at all the wills. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and will increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness and you will be enriched in every way. Like God can do this, Paul says. Oh, and God will do this. And again, he's just stringing the alls together. God can do these things and God will do these things. Now, remember, we're supposed to decide ahead of time, okay, this is what I'm going to give. And then we're supposed to faithfully do it. And notice, God will supply your store of seed. We're talking about sowing. And Paul says, if you decide this, God will supply the seed to sow. And then God will increase it. I think meaning, you know, you're going to sow this one year, and then the next year you're going to sow even more because you're going to get more back. And God will enlarge the harvest. So we decide we're going to give, and then we faithfully give, and God provides us with what we need to sow, to give, and God provides us with the harvest. All we do is decide and are faithful, and God does all these things. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. God says, if you will decide this, if you will decide it and do this, then I will see that you are enriched. I will see that you have what you need to do what you said you're going to do. I will see that you reap. You sow for blessing and you will reap for blessing. I will see that you are enriched. Now, again, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. There is a whole group of preachers out there. We call it the prosperity gospel, who take these passages and make it one-to-one. -one. If you sow money, you'll reap money. If you give me $10, you'll get $100. If you give me $100, you'll get a car. That's not what Scripture says. It's not one-to-one. -one. You cannot guarantee what God gives back to you in blessing. Oh, but you can guarantee he will give back to you in blessing. That he promises. He does not promise the what, the when, how it's going to look. But he absolutely promises. I mean, how many times does he say this? God is able. God will bless you at all times, at all ways. Everything you need, you will abound. He will supply your seed. He will increase your store. He will enlarge your harvest. He will enrich you. How many times has he got to say this? God will do this. All we do is sit down and decide, this is what I care about in God's kingdom. This is how I'm going to support it. And then we do that. And notice what he says happens next at the end of verse 11. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Paul's going to take that money that they donate in Corinth. And he's going to take it back to Jerusalem. And he's going to give it to the Christians at Jerusalem. And the Christians in Jerusalem are going to thank God. They're going to thank. They have been praying for God to meet their needs. God's going to meet their needs through the Corinthians' generosity. And they're going to thank God. This is why giving is part of worship. Because when you give, it comes back to God. God is thanks. He'll say in the next one, look at where this service you perform. It's not only supplying the needs of God's people, but it's overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. When you give, you not only supply the needs of the people that you're giving to. You know, when you give to this church, you're paying my salary. 
You're paying Tim's salary. You're paying the lights. You're paying Jordan's salary. All these people that, that we are grateful. It's one of the things we say every morning. We meet every morning to pray and read scripture. One of the things we pray every morning is thank you, Lord. Thank you for providing for us. Thank you that we have enough money to pay our bills. We pray that every single day. We thank God. God is worshiped and thanked because you gave. That's why giving is part of worship. And when Paul says, this service you perform, he uses this really interesting word. It's only used a couple times in all the scriptures because it's a word from the Greek city-state where, you know how we have jury duty? That's like your civic duty. In the ancient world, in the Greek city-states, tons of stuff was like that. Tons of things that we would consider city councilor, judges, serving in the army, none of that was paid. You were expected to do that as a good citizen. You were expected one week out of every year to come and be a judge in these cases. You didn't get a stipend. You didn't get anything. You just were expected to do it. They have no standing army. If someone attacks, you're called up. You're expected to provide your own armor, your own weapons. Come out there at your own expense and fight. That, that's, that's your, it's this word, that's your service. It's voluntary public service that you're not going to get anything back for. You know, if you give $100 to Hope Now to help with these Ukrainian orphans that they're evacuating, right? Chances are, 10 years from now, you're not going to get a knock on the door and some 20-year-old's going to be standing there and saying, hi, 10 years ago, I was a Ukrainian orphan and you gave $100 and here I want to pay you back. <laughs> it could happen, highly unlikely. You're probably not going to get anything back from it. You're just voluntarily doing it and it goes out. You are meeting their needs, but Paul says, oh, but it, it results in praise and thanks to God. Those people, when they receive their gift, they may not even know you gave it, but it comes back in worship to God. Not only do we worship right now as we sit here, but your money as you give away to God's kingdom in other places, that brings worship back to God as well, even though we're all right here. You know, you sit here, Wow, your money can be anywhere on the planet, helping God's kingdom all over the place. And look at what he says next. Because, verse 13, because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God. So again, praise and thanksgiving to God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. Again, brothers and sisters, this is not voluntary. This is obedience. You are commanded to give. Your brothers and sisters thousands of years ago in the Old Testament, they were commanded to give and they were commanded how to give. You are commanded to give, but you are not commanded how. That is left up to you. You must give, but to whom, when, where, how much, you are allowed to decide all of that. But it is obedience to our confession of the gospel of Christ. Confession means to agree. To say the same thing. What's the gospel of Christ? That Jesus saved us when we couldn't save ourselves. That when we hated him, he loved us. We can never pay him back for that. What Jesus did for us, he did freely. He did without us being able to pay. We will never do that for him. We will never die and pay for his sins so he can be with his father in heaven. He did for us what we could never do for ourselves. He did it freely, and Scripture says he considered it a joy, and we are to be like him. Our obedience is to agree with the gospel. Jesus did this for me, and so I'm going to do this for you. I am going to give freely to you, knowing you're not going to give it back to me, knowing I'm not going to get it back. I'm going to do it because Jesus gave to me. And because it comes back to God in worship and praise and thanksgiving. And we want that. As God's people, we want all of those things. And then look at verse 14, because he's not done with what giving does. I mean, think of all the things we've said. Giving means that God then comes and gives to you and enlarges you and protects you and enriches you. Giving results in praise and thanksgiving to God. Giving is your obedience. It's us saying, this is what Jesus did for me. And then in verse 14, and in their prayers for you, their heart will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. We get prayed for when we give. 
When the Corinthians gave this money and Paul took it to Jerusalem and he gave it to the Christians there, they thanked God for his mercy and they thanked God for the Corinthians. They asked God to be gracious to the Corinthians, to to help the Corinthians. The Corinthians got prayed for by people they probably never met and probably never will because they gave. Because that's part of how God works all these things together. These people that they will never meet, but they were generous, gave to them. They in turn then pray. Think about all of these things that happen when you decide, okay, yep, I'm going to give, I'm going to do this, and then you do it. And so Paul ends in verse verse 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Because it's a gift. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need us to pay for anything. He doesn't need us to do anything. He's not sitting up there thinking, wow, I I really wish somebody would give a hundred bucks to help that. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. There's this great verse in in scripture, this little interplay, where God says to somebody, "Um, you know, if I'm hungry, I don't need to ask you for food. I own the whole planet. He doesn't need us. It's a gift. Giving is a gift. Getting to give is a gift. It, 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 it opens up him giving to us. It brings praise and thanksgiving to him. It, it shows everyone we actually believe the gospel. The gospel says Jesus gave to us freely. So we give to others freely. Because we believe it and he's commanded it. And we will obey him. It means people are praying for us. People are praying for you you've never met. In places you'll never visit. Because you gave to something. So here's what I want you to remember, okay? If you've been tuning out, you're on your phone, that's fine. But, but here, th- th- this is important. Here's the two things I want you to remember, okay? The first is, you must do this. This is a requirement. You are obligated to give. It is obedience. But where you give, how you give, who you give, when you give, you get to choose that. You have what no one before Jesus had for them, This is what it was, and they had to obey the law. You get to choose, but you must choose. You cannot just go along thinking, well, yeah, you know, maybe I'll see someone, or maybe I'll do something. Paul says, decide ahead of time what you're going to give and give it. If you've never done that, go home today and do that. Again, from your heart, from who you are. Okay? Let me be clear. You don't have to give money to this church. Okay? Paul's not raising money for his church. He's raising money for another church. You are not obligated to give to anything in particular. Now, I hope from your heart, right, your head and your your, your gut, your, your brains and your feelings, I hope you would want out of that to give to the church, right? I hope, like me, you want to pay off this mortgage so we can take $12,000, $13,000 a month and start plowing it back into ministry. But if that's not your heart, give where your heart is. Give based on who you are, but you must do that. It is a requirement. If you've never done that, sit down this afternoon, pray about it, and make a decision. If you're married, obviously sit down with your spouse, right? And if you think, oh, my spouse will never go, let God worry about your spouse, okay? That, 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 your job is not to change your spouse's mind. That is the Lord's. Your job is just to obey. Sit down and decide, okay, what does God want me to give? Your situation Your income level, your obligations, your brain, your emotions, you, your heart. What does the Lord want you to give? Decide. If you've never done that before, go home today and decide. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give $50 a month to the chances to support them. And then start. Start this month. Do it. Do it next month. Do it the next month. Okay? I'm going to give money to Grant and Sophia. Write the check. Go home and decide what you're going to do, and then put it in motion. That's the first thing I want you to remember. This is a command. And the second thing I want you to remember is you are an idiot not to do this. Oh my gosh, you are so foolish not to do this. There is only one place in all the Bible where God says, test me. Testing God, bad, 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 bad. Okay, when Satan comes to Jesus and tries to convince him to do something wrong by quoting the Bible, Jesus says back to him, yeah, the Bible also says don't test God. Testing God, bad. One place in the book of Malachi, 
about giving. Where God says, try it. Try it and see if I respond. Test me on this. Wow, you're not going to get that deal any other place in your Christian life. In Proverbs, at one point, the, the author of Proverbs says, he who gives to the poor lends to God. Not gives to God, lends to God. And God will repay him, the author says. And again, where else in your Christian life does God say to you, I owe you for that one? I, 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 the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth, the sovereign Lord of life and death, I owe you. You have lent me something. Where else are you ever going to lend something to God? And God promises he will repay you. Oh, and he keeps his promises and he repays in spades. Again, it's not prosperity gospel. It's not one-to-one. You can't, man, well, here, God, I'm giving you a dollar. Give me 10 back. You can't decide when. You can't decide where. You can't decide how. That's on him. Good. He's better at it than we are. He's way kinder and generous. Again, I handed out two empty rooms. Oh, my gosh, did I get blessed back. I'm going to be blessed for the rest of my life. You can't tell God how to bless you back, which is good because he'll do a way better job of it than you will. You must do this, number one. It's a command. If you've never sat down and done it before, do it today when you get home. Okay? If you haven't done it in a while, sit down or sit down with your spouse and do it again because life changes. Income changes, expense changes. I have two kids in university right now, one in undergrad and one in grad school. I cannot be as generous as I will be able to do when they are both out of school. That's just a reality of life. If you haven't done this in a while, sit down, look at your situation, pray, see what God wants you to do. You must do it. That's the first thing. And the second thing is you are a fool not to. You will never see anything else in scripture where God tells you, oh, try me out on this. Give, give and try me out. See if these things Paul says are true. If God really will, if you decide something and God will supply you what you need. If God will enlarge it so you can do more the next time around. If God will give you the harvest, he will enlarge your harvest of righteousness. If God will enrich you, he says to test him out on that. Oh, take him up on his offer. He says, you give it away, you've lent it to me. I will absolutely give it back to you. Wow, take those odds. You are not going to get them anywhere else on this planet, anywhere in your life. And we have not even begun to talk about the stuff Jesus says about storing up stuff in heaven. You are double dipping. You are getting things here and you're getting them in heaven. That should not be right. But God apparently is not good at accounting. He pays you back here on earth and he pays you back again in heaven. When I first graduated from college, I joined InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. I'm a classics major. Finance is not my thing. I was not married to Elizabeth yet. And InterVarsity had a 401k, and it had a matching program up to 4% of your salary. I had no idea what any of those words meant. But it seemed something you should do. So I asked another guy on staff whose name was Jeff, who was a finance guy. Graduated with a finance degree, actually went on to become a financial planner when he left InterVarsity. I'm like, Jeff, help me out here. Should I do this? Because this is 1989, I think I made $12,000 before taxes working for InterVarsity that year. So it's not like I got tons of money to burn to put it away in whatever a 401k is. Jeff looked at me like I had lost my mind. He grabbed me by the shoulders and he said, Jeff, it's free money. Yes, you should do this. Oh my gosh, 4%, absolutely. If it goes up to five, put in five. If it goes up to six, put in six. It's free money. Okay, brothers and sisters, it's free blessing. It's free blessing. You are a moron not to take God up on his offer. Decide. This is what I care about in your kingdom, Lord. This is what I'm going to do. And do it. And watch what he does. I've lived as a missionary all my life. Up until you guys started paying me, I had never had a salary I have never lacked. I've never lacked. I was fortunate to have a father who taught this to us growing up, to be generous. My dad has given away more cars than I can count. Elizabeth and I have only given away two cars, so we're working on catching up to him. I have never lacked a car. Not on this continent, 
Not in Asia, not in Africa, not when I came home on furlough, not when I got kicked out of the country because of a coup. I have never lacked for a car. And I have given them away. Wow, take him up on his offer. You will never get a better deal than this. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. You don't have to be this generous. I mean, you could just command it. You could just say, yep, it could be like it was under your people with Moses. It could be you give this much and you give it here and you give it this way and this is the way it's going to be. You don't have to reward us. You don't have to bless us. You don't have to do everything Paul says. You could command that we must give and then we've got to give it. But Paul says you will supply what we need. You will enlarge it. You will grow it. You will enrich us. Thank you. Oh, Lord, that is so gracious of you. And I confess to my brothers and sisters, boy, I have seen you do that over and over and over again. I know the truth my father taught me. You cannot outgive God. He will always come back with more. He will never be outgiven. Thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that you bless us back in ways we would never consider and are so much better than anything we would think of. Thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for including us. You don't need us. Thank you for, as Paul says, this indescribable gift that we get to participate, that we get to supply other people's needs, that we get to do something that results in you being worshiped, that we get to do things where you say you owe us and you will pay us back because you have never reneged on a debt. Thank you. That, that's so gracious of you. We're so grateful, Lord. You don't have to do this. You could be just. You could be good. You could be right. And you could just command it. But instead, you command it. And then you make it possible. And then you reward us. And then you increase it. Thank you. You are so, so gracious to us. Thank you for this indescribable gift you give us that we get to give and participate in your kingdom. Thank you that you let us choose. You let us choose where and when and how and who. Thank you. You are so generous. And Jesus, we want to be like you. That's what Paul says. We're, we're just <laughs> confessing the gospel again that you died for us when we had nothing to offer you. And so we give to others expecting nothing in return from them, but knowing full well you will bless us. Thank you, Jesus. We truly want to be like you. And so we pray all this in your name. Amen. Now let's finish this part of our service as we always do, reminding ourselves of what Jesus has done for us that we in turn want to do for others. He did it for us with his very life. He doesn't ask us for our lives. He just asks us that we give. So I'm going to pray for us again. I'm going to bless the elements. They're in all four corners in the room. And then as well, there's gluten-free down here on this table to my right if you need that. After I've finished praying, go, take the bread, take the cup, take it individually this time. This is between you and God because that's what Paul says. Each of you must decide. He's not talking to us as the church altogether. He's talking to us as individuals. So take the bread, take the cup, bring it back to your seat. Talk to him. See if he has anything to say. Take the elements in whatever time frame you desire. And then I will close us in a prayer and we'll finish up with worship again. So pray with me. Uh, Jesus, thank you. Even more than we are grateful for your gift of being able to participate, your gift of giving. Thank you that you started it. You know, you didn't tell us to give and prove ourselves and then you would save us. You saved us. And then you invite us to come be part of what you're doing. But even if we say no, you have still saved us. Even if we never give anything ever, you still love us and have still saved us. You did that first. Thank you. Thank you. We are so grateful, Lord. We do now what you told us to do. We remember. That's what you said, to do these things. Take this bread, take this cup, and remember you. So Jesus, we do this and we remember you. And I pray for my brothers and sisters as we each take this individually, just as Paul says individually, we have to make this decision. Then I pray, Jesus, you would speak to us. Holy Spirit, I pray you would talk to us. 
Are there ways you want us to give that are different from what we're doing? Are there things you want us to start? Are there things you want us to stop? All that we have is yours. So we pray in your name. Amen. I thank you. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your body and your blood. We remember. We remember what this cost you. It is a free gift to us, but it was not free to you. And yet scripture says, for the joy set before you, you endured the cross. You scorned its shame. Thank you. We're so grateful, Lord. We are so grateful for your kindness to us, that you did this before we knew you. You loved us before we loved you. You saved us before we pledged ourselves to you. Thank you. We are so, so grateful. Lord, accept our worship as we sing again. We have remembered what you have done for us. Now we sing your praises because you are our good God and we are your people. We love you and we're yours. Amen. Stand with me. Let's sing again.
you, Lord. Thank you so much for what you've done for us. I pray that the truth of what your sacrifice means for us transforms us as we go into this week. Um, I know for myself, getting caught up in whatever is going on on earth that I, I forget of how incomparable your sacrifice has been for us. Like Jeff said earlier, you expect nothing in return. You know that we could not give back that type of sacrifice, but I just thank you. I thank you so much. Thank you so much for what you've done. I thank you for the chance that we have um, to worship you together as a congregation and as a body of Christ. Um, that's a blessing that doesn't exist in all parts of the world. Um, so I pray as we go into this week um, that we don't forget, that we don't forget your sacrifice for us. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dunwoody Community Church, you are sent and have a wonderful week.